Good morning. Thanks to Tomasic and Tomasic Foundation for giving me the privilege of um, addressing you. Keynote speech isn't quite the right word. I think keynote remarks might be more suitable. I'll say a few things very broadly um, on the themes that you're working on. Uh, and then we'll have a dialogue and um, listen to views um, from, from all of you. I think you're onto something very important in this uh, Asia, the Philanthropy Asia Summit. Uh, and this inaugural summit is, I think, uh, very well timed. Uh, you're onto something very important. We, the basic purpose of this uh, gathering and the gatherings that you plan in future and the work streams that you plan in future is to shift away from traditional philanthropy, which is individualized, sometimes even a little transactional, you know, the typical checkbook philanthropy, move away from that towards collective action, collective amongst philanthropies, but also developing a new compact between philanthropies, governments, or the public sector, and the private sector. And this is going to be extremely important in the years to come as we address the biggest challenges we face both globally as well as within our own societies. And I, I wasn't here, but I read um, Tomasic CEO Dylan Pillay's um, uh, remarks earlier this morning. I think he summarized it well. The whole purpose is to catalyze partnerships, partnerships for impact, and partnerships for the common good. And each of those three points is instructive. Catalyze partnerships, impact, common good. And that should be our orientation. There's a lot to be done, and I know you've launched some, or you're working now on important initiatives to take forward, and we've got to scale that up to more initiatives, more philanthropies, more partners, and more global scale. And I think importantly, what you're doing is also recognizing that financing, finance is a force for good. It has to be a force for good. At the very least, it can't hold things back, but finance can be a powerful force for the common good. And we've got to organize ourselves to make that possible. The starting point, uh, was a very unkind pandemic. Unkind particularly to those who are already disadvantaged. Lower income, children from families who couldn't quite cope with studying at home. And countries, whole communities and countries <clears throat> that really have been set back very badly. They were already behind and they've been set back further. So the pandemic has been extremely unkind to those who are already further behind. But the pandemic also saw an outpouring of kindness, a tremendous outpouring of kindness. And in fact, philanthropic giving uh, soared in the last year, something like $20 billion globally, far more than happened after the global financial crisis or other major crises in the past. And we've got to make sure that this isn't just episodic. It's not just a cataclysm that should, that should lead to this giving. We've got to now find ways in which we, I hesitate to say institutionalize, but the way in which we keep this going, keep the momentum going. And the way to do it is, that, is like this initiative, coalescing partnerships, finding a way in which we motivate each other collaborate with each other, bring skills and expertise together. And it really can be done. The three initiatives that I know you're taking forward this morning are very good examples. The Mangrove Cities um, Alliance, M40, the Alliance for Circular and Resilient Cities, with the Malacca being a very good example, and inclusive education. And I'll have to say that amongst the gaps that are opening up as a result of COVID, or rather accentuated by COVID, the largest gap we have globally 
is the gap in learning. It was already large, and it has now widened considerably. And the consequences of this gap, unlike gaps in income or wealth, the consequences of a gap in learning are for the long term. They shape future trajectories that are wider, than, wider apart than before. And the consequences of that will obviously not just be economic, they will be much more than economic consequences globally. So we have to take that seriously. The orientation you're taking is to address big challenges, big challenges within our own societies and globally. And I think that's the way we should sort of frame, frame our minds. And the biggest challenges we now face are the challenges that are existential, the challenges to the existential commons, climate security and pandemic security, and the challenge we face of widening gaps in opportunities within our societies and globally, which I just touched on. I would say those are the three major challenges, climate and biodiversity, the degradation of both the climate and biodiversity commons, pandemic security that goes together with that, and the opening up the widening of gaps in inequalities within almost every society and certainly globally. And it cannot be addressed in the traditional ways, where the public sector does its thing, it tries to have taxes, redistribution, private sector, some corporate leaders take the lead, and you hope that markets do their job. Markets will not be able to solve this on their own. And it can't be done by philanthropies on their own, no matter how well-intentioned. It does require a more concerted and a much more involved partnership between philanthropies, the public sector, and the private sector. A much more involved partnership. And each brings something somewhat different, different skills, different orientations, different missions. I wouldn't say completely different missions, but overlapping missions which are still distinct, as they have to be. The private sector discipline is important in all of this, focusing on the outcomes we are trying to achieve, focusing on what impact we are trying to achieve, and having some discipline of working towards it. It's a very important private sector discipline that is often missing when we talk about public mission and, and trying to serve the broader good. We need that private sector discipline. We need the public sector, first and foremost, of course, to provide incentives through taxes, through regulation, we need the public sector and we need political leadership as well to promote trust, which is a critical ingredient in everything we're trying to do. Trust within our own societies first and foremost, but also trust globally. We need political leadership in the public sector. And we need philanthropies, not just in the traditional sense of needing a flow of money that goes towards charity, which is important, just like government redistribution is important. But that's not going to solve the big problems of the day. We need philanthropies because they do have a different risk absorption capacity. They do have the ability to take risks where the private sector can't, and they do have the ability to fail, which we must expect as we now invest in the technologies and the innovations of the future. So we need philanthropies as well, and we have to think about it from the perspective of an investment ecosystem and not just a charity ecosystem. The, another way I could illustrate this is by just describing the scale of the challenge. If you just take climate transition alone, just take transition alone, Various estimates, obviously not very precise, but roughly speaking, we're going to need between 100 to $150 trillion US dollars over the next 30 years in investments. Investments in new technologies, 
paying for mothballing of old technologies, investments of one kind or another. So let's say at least $3 trillion per year, at least $3 trillion per year. And that's not likely to be an overestimate. Today, the size of global assets under management, or the global investment industry, more broadly speaking, is about $110 trillion. So $3 trillion sounds like a lot, and it's certainly a lot more than has been going towards new technologies and innovations, and a lot more that's been going towards the financing of transition so far. But if you think of $110 trillion, each year it grows by more than $3 trillion. The increment alone is equal to the amount of monies that we're talking about that need to go into transition. And that's not counting the reorientation of existing funds and investments within that 110 trillion. So if you think of it on that broad scale, although these numbers sound daunting, and they sounded daunting in COP26, it is achievable. It is achievable. There is money and wealth out there that needs to be incentivized, to some extent needs to be corralled, but we need to organize this. And it does require the public, private, and philanthropic sector. And the reason why it requires critically that partnership, and it can't just be left to the markets, is because a significant portion of the technologies required for transition are in fact not yet bankable or investable. Some are marginally bankable, some are still some ways off. The International Energy Association estimates that roughly half the technologies that we think are going to be required and we hope will eventually become, will, will materialize, are not there yet. Still being developed, some at the basic R&D stage, many of them now in translational research and development. But they're not there yet. And you cannot expect the private sector to invest in something that's not there yet. It's not yet bankable, not yet investable, but it will get there. And we can't just wait for it to get there because the next 10 to 15 years is critical. And as we all know, you can't continue to emit as much as you want now and then find a way of taking it back later. It doesn't work that way in the science. So we've got to move ahead now, step up the pace of innovation, step up the pace of applying new technologies, developing and applying new technologies. And it cannot be done by the private sector alone. The private returns adjusted for risk are not high enough, but the social returns of these new technologies are extremely large. If you take a portfolio of new technologies, the social returns of investing in them, even if many of them fail, the social returns that come out of the winning technologies are immense. It's like an mRNA vaccine. Ten years ago, high risk, no one knew if it even made sense. Eventually, a few succeed, and they succeed phenomenally and the social returns of getting vaccines into arms around the world are phenomenal. And by the way, I use the word social returns the way the economists use it. It's actually an economic concept. The economic benefits that the whole of society derives are phenomenal. But the private returns are not there yet. And that's why you need the public sector and philanthropies to fill that gap. And there's a economic and financial case for the public sector to get involved because the social returns will more than pay off the investments that the public sector makes. So that's the basic logic for why the public sector has to be part of this game and has to see it as a financial investment with immense payoff in future. And we've got to explain that to our publics. We've got to find a way of budgeting for it. And we've got to find ways of collaborating internationally as we do it, rather than each country on its own. The way in which we are going about it 
we'll have to involve both you know, COP26 type initiatives, which are extremely important, trying to get harmonization of standards, trying to get every country to move their targets, to move towards more ambitious targets, getting everyone to have more concrete transition strategies. But I think in the partnerships we are developing, as you're doing now, between philanthropies, private sector, and public sector, we have to focus on concrete initiatives that we can get going on, like your mangrove forests and the like. Because if you look at the world of emissions, seven to eight key sources of emissions account for the majority of emissions. And within each of those key areas, there are large emitters. So working on the large emitters and working on the large emitting activities has a very high payoff. And we have to get going on that. And here I'm just talking about carbon emissions, but you can think of the same for the biodiversity, you can think of the same for pandemic security, and you can think of the same when you think of those widening gaps in opportunities. Focus on the needle moving changes and get going on it. I think that should be our orientation. Don't just wait for the realization of a grand agenda because it takes time and multilateralism is weak. We've got to get going on the key areas where we can achieve change and collaborate more intensely than before. We are doing what we can now in Singapore to develop a thicker philanthropy ecosystem. And your initiative is an extremely important one, not just for Singapore, but for the region and to some extent further afield. And in the government, we take this very seriously. How do we support the philanthropy ecosystem? The MAS and EDB have been working jointly on this. And an important part of it is going to be capabilities. As we all know, in every area of life, every business, the capabilities matter. And we need to develop the skills and capabilities for this philanthropy ecosystem. And we look forward to doing it together with you. We are working with the Wealth Management Institute to develop a Global Asia Family Office Circle just like you're doing this morning, bringing people together, bringing the, the family principals together, as well as their, their staff. We're developing a ladder of skills and competencies through the Institute of Banking and Finance for the finance professionals to be able to advise families and, and foundations. Developing that set of skills amongst finance professionals is very important. And of course, more broadly, we're developing that whole set of skills required for trust in carbon markets and carbon trading, which doesn't yet exist today. It requires data, it requires technologies, it requires skills. And that's a very important broader agenda that we embarked on. So I'll just stop there by, by way of those broad remarks, but Essentially, we have to not think of this in transactional terms. We have to not think of it simply in terms of distributing resources from one group or set of people to another. We have to think of it by way of developing a culture of partnerships and solidarity. Life is just much more meaningful and satisfying when their lives together and their lives that are moving up together. We all know that. And we've got to now collaborate to make that possible, to make all lives better. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, SM. If you could just take your seat, SM. And coming up to moderate is Jamie Lee from Business Times. Thank you so much, Jamie. SM, we love that move from checkbook philanthropy to catalytic philanthropy. We're with you there. Thank you, everybody. Uh, welcome to this uh, session, and thank you very much, SM, for that uh, uh, keynote address. Um, I'd just like to encourage everybody, of course, to send in your questions. Uh, you may, of course, scan the QR code um, to send those questions along. We already have some, but I thought we could open by talking about um, how do we break this down um, for philanthropy uh, or philanthropist uh, organizations that are out there. There are so many competing needs. Um, 
how do we coordinate this um, and where can Singapore play a pivotal role in this? So I think the basic um, shift that we have to make is from thinking about philanthropy, and this shift is already taking place, thinking about philanthropy not in terms of charity, but as risk capital. Risk capital that is being applied to catalyze broader business action, and to some extent also to catalyze governments. That's the way we have to think about philanthropy. There is enough of a space of opportunities for businesses and philanthropies to earn good returns by doing the right thing, by doing good. And that isn't just rhetoric, that is actually planning, identification of opportunities, and it is really about working with companies to make transitions so that you can do the right thing and continue to do good business and earn good returns. And that is actually our biggest challenge today. It is not about divestment, although I would say divestment is still a useful part of a carrot and stick approach, but it's fundamentally not about divestment. It's about working with and incentivizing companies more broadly sector after sector, to make a transition from brown to gray and from gray to green. And investors are critical in that. As you know, even small activist investors are able to influence a broader group of investors, including the institutional investors, to force change on the part of companies. And it's happened in some very prominent cases recently. But that's, that's actually the big game. It's about the existing base of industry being able to make a transition. I don't believe it will happen purely through carbon taxes, although the carbon taxes are going to be necessary. And I say I don't believe it because I don't think carbon taxes will rise sharply enough, quickly enough. It requires investors. And I think the large institutional investors, plus all the ethically-minded uh, investors and family officers and everyone else behind them, goaded on by public opinion, which is going to shift over time, will be a very effective force in persuading and incentivizing companies themselves, boards of directors and management, to make serious transition, industry after industry. And as I mentioned, Focus on the industries that matter the most critically from a climate and biodiversity point of view and focus more broadly across industry on inclusivity. There's so much that can be done. But businesses need to think about inclusivity as part of their mission, right? Typically, it's always thought of through of economic value and bringing over shareholder value. Um, how should businesses think about integrating this into their business-as-usual operations? So, that's a very good question, uh, Jamie. Um, again, here, just as we spoke about philanthropy moving away from just charity towards thinking of philanthropy as risk capital, businesses have to also move away from thinking of doing good as just CSR towards thinking about their core activities. And the core activity of every business is your employees, who you hire, how you go about hiring, and how you develop people through time. And there again, you find that from the experience of corporates around the world, including in Singapore, companies that do a better job in developing people, and companies increasingly that are deliberately going out to seek out diversity of various forms in their hiring and career development practices, are actually doing well. There's a large space of opportunity for companies to do good for their employees and to do good for the company and shareholders. In fact, very little trade-off. And I think that is still the most important way in which companies can promote a more inclusive society. It's what they do with their own employees and to some extent what they do with their smaller suppliers, 
in the supply chains that they're in, because larger companies have some influence over that. I think that actually is extremely important. And the more that we have of that type of responsible conduct of business, the less you need governments to get involved with various other redistributive exercises. I, I think we'll need redistribution for a long time to come, for, probably forever. But we need companies themselves to do the right thing. But do you think they're being rewarded for perhaps taking a first mover advantage? Perhaps they don't see that benefit so soon and they're waiting for their next peer to, to take on that, uh, that, that challenge before that. So how would they reconcile that as businesses? Well, it's not a sharp trade-off. Um, it's not a sharp trade-off. and you, the, When you get role models amongst companies who show how it can be done, and you find that talent moves towards companies that are more diverse and take their employees very seriously mm. and develop their employees through their, mm. through their careers over their lives. Um, that's also a market discipline. Uh, when talent moves, it's a market discipline. So I'd say that the trade-off is not sharp when it comes to being inclusive with regard to your own workforce. Let me turn to some of the questions that have been posed. Uh, one question is, what policies can Singapore introduce to encourage philanthropy? What are the best practices for governments who are looking to increase philanthropic activities? Maybe take that one. Well, you know, Singapore, as you know, has been um, a little bolder uh, with regard to incentives for philanthropic giving. And you all know about the tax incentives. Um, the more that we can encourage philanthropies and the public at large to get in the act of giving and in developing partnerships, uh, the less we will need over time for more stringent forms of redistribution through the tax and transfer system. So the more that is done voluntarily by those who have wealth and those who are better off, the less you'll need for government to step into the game eventually through a more formal tax and transfer system. Mm -hmm. You need both, but I think leadership on the part of philanthropies and corporates to do the right thing uh, leads to not just an alternative way of transferring monies, it leads to a better culture. Mm -hmm. It leads to a culture that um, people can see and feel uh, that's quite different from simply having governments collect taxes and then finding the best way of distributing it to the right people. It's quite a different culture. So there was a question about whether Singapore would extend tax deductibility uh, to philanthropy giving. So I assume that it's not, is, is that something? Sorry, re can you repeat it Tax again? deductibility, to, to basically uh, take some tax off uh, the table every time. So we, we're already taking a lot of tax off the table, uh, more than probably any other country when it comes to incentivizing giving. Uh, there are some remaining issues to do with giving overseas versus giving locally that we are looking at. Um, I believe we have to develop a philanthropic ecosystem in Singapore that is really part of a broader region. So it could extend beyond just giving in Singapore to global and, and how the... It's an issue to be looked at. I'm not making a policy announcement today. It's an issue to be... As a journalist, I do have to ask a little but bit. But you know, you know my leaning. You know my leaning. Um, there was also a question about um, how does the world address the issue of incentives of, of poor countries versus the rich? I think COP26, the wider backdrop for that, for example, is that a lot of the funds have to be channeled from developed markets to developing markets uh, in order to see uh, significant progress in that area. How, how do you think about that? How should we reconcile that? So it's a very important issue. I spoke earlier about technologies, the fact that you know, roughly half the technologies required for climate transition are not yet bankable or investable. The other big challenge is the developing world. Uh, a very substantial part of this at least $3 trillion that I spoke about has to go towards the developing world. And the market is going, isn't going to lead to that allocation of resources as it stands. We need to find ways of de-risking investment in the developing world Honestly, if you talk to any leading global institutional asset manager, mm. 
including you know, the names that we all know about are you know, very positively inclined towards supporting climate transition and so on. When you really talk to the leading players, you will come away with the realization that not much money is actually going to go into the developing world. We therefore need a way of incentivizing the market and of working together with the markets. I think we are vastly underutilizing the multilateral development banks, the regional development banks, and some of the bilateral um, uh, development corporations uh, that are in the business of working with the developing world. We are underutilizing them. They're very efficient institutions because shareholder capital is leveraged on the capital markets and their resources can be used to also incentivize governments to do their own domestic revenue raising and to use monies more effectively. They're very powerful institutions and we're underutilizing them. We have to shift the whole MDB game, multilateral development banks game, away from lending on their balance sheets towards risk mitigation. And there's, there's, there's very significant potential for this. If you look at the size of the World Bank plus all the other RDBs, regional development banks, plus the bilateral players, if we shift from a model of lending on their balance sheets towards risk mitigation for private capital, uh, the multiplication potential is very significant. Mm -hmm. Secondly, we have to pool risk across projects and countries. One of the reasons for perceived high risk on the part of institutional investors, particularly high risk for individual projects, is that there's very little diversification in that. We've got to pool risks from a mine or power plant or any other important investment in a typical developing country towards treating it as a portfolio. Mm. And that too is quite doable. It's been done in the developed world, all forms of securitization, and we've got to do it for the developing world on a much larger scale. So risk mitigate by having first loss guarantees and other instruments applied by the public sector and the global public sector. And secondly, pool risks so as to diversify risk and make it more attractive, particularly to institutional investors. I think it, it's a very important shift that has to take place in, in global finance. Would markets need to be developed to create more liquidity around that such that risks um, can be found in the water finance? So, uh, exactly, that's what has to happen. But the more you can pool risks and create an asset class rather than individual project investments, mm. um, the more you get the liquidity. Mm. Again, it's not as if there's a lack of money. I mean, there's a huge wall of money waiting on the side, but the risk return calculations don't work out the right way right now. But there is also that debate about, uh, let's say for ESG investments, people want a return and for, for some time it's been hawked um, as a good return. Um, and that's why you've seen more short-term um, encouragement around getting these assets in. But some of these um, projects or these investments take a long time. And for that to be sustainable, you need to expect that there were some losses uh, in the short to medium term. So these are conf conflicts and dilemmas that I think um, investors are thinking through as well. So I just wonder how you think through that. So there are a few uh, elements of what you just said, Jamie. Uh, one is what we touched on earlier, which is some things take time. Not yet bankable, eventually it will become bankable. But those are the investments that have high social returns, even if private returns are low. The public sector has to step in. Philanthropies have to step in. We have to find a way of incentivizing private investment earlier rather than later. But there's another uh, issue which is extremely important, uh, which is uh, what you might call ESG washing. We know about green washing, and to some extent, there's also a broader ESG washing. We need to collect better data. We need better verification. We need to even use technologies to have better verification, including satellites. Uh, that whole ecosystem required for investors to know that what they're investing in is truly mm -hmm. moving brown to green, mm -hmm. is truly ethical. Uh, that whole ecosystem is still in a fragmentary state. And we have to develop that. And, and by the way, in Singapore, we're trying our best now to develop both the capabilities as well as the data exchanges required for this.
There's questions as well about capabilities uh, on this. Uh, how can sort of Singapore incentivize the build-up of capabilities uh, on, on this front? Philanthropy, um, ESG as well as, as a broad part of that. So it's, you know, a lot of this is in the doing. Uh, it's like this, this summit you've organized. It's what we're doing with the Wealth Management Institute, working with SMU, working with, in fact, all our universities. A lot of it is in the doing. Um, I mean, the public sector in Singapore is willing to put resources into it, and we're already doing so. Uh, I think we've got to achieve momentum now. Uh, and momentum comes from concrete initiatives, people looking at what's being achieved, getting a bit excited about it, and more people wanting to do the same. Momentum is extremely important at this stage of the game. Mm -hmm. Can we go back to um, the COVID-19 as, as a backdrop, right? There have been a lot of needs. We've seen that you know, a large number of people have moved back into extreme poverty, for example. And there were also examples put here, for example, using education to bring social mobility back to the table. Um, how should you know, philanthropy uh, organizations think about this then? How should they organize themselves to be thinking about the true pressing needs, um, which needs have a multiplier effect that they could capitalize on, or should they work better together? Um, how, how, how should we think about the pandemic uh, response you know, for the years ahead? Well, I think in the short term, uh, it has been a response of providing relief because that was very important. Uh, people were really hard done by, and rel disbursing relief quickly was very important. But we now have to think about the medium to long term, and that requires closing structural gaps in learning beyond COVID-19's uh, impact. The structural gaps are extremely wide. In fact, I mean, the largest inequality in the world is not wealth inequality or income inequality. It is the gaps in reading and arithmetic at age 10 that is by far the largest inequality in the world. And it's, it's stunning. Uh, and in the countries where they've allowed this to fester for some time, it's, it's really almost criminal that they've allowed this to happen. Whole generations are now fated for a life that is, has much less potential uh, than they would have been capable of. And girls in particular have, have been getting not just, not just uh, the inability to achieve their basic potential, they're really being subject to a life of subjugation. And what happens in that first phase of life, preschool and primary school, to some extent secondary school, is critical. And we really have to address this issue very seriously. Again, it's not gonna come from a grand plan across the world. It has to come from concrete initiatives, country by country. International institutions are important. Groups like Room to Read are very important. We've got to work on concrete initiatives, train up the teachers, get better motivated teaching forces, and use technology more effectively. And I think both technology, as well as our ability to train up teachers and make them part of a better profession uh, in a whole range of countries is, is uh, really one of our biggest tasks. I mean, may I suggest that if, if businesses think of gender diversity as starting from ensuring that young girls have a, a access to education, um, they might be able to broaden their sort of mandate and think about philanthropy in, 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 the, in that respect. Well, everyone has to get involved. I, I think this requires partnerships. Um, some institutions are uh, taking the lead uh, in specific countries. But we should use that, use that as um, lighthouses, you know. You create a very interesting example, show what can be, can be done. More governments get interested in it. The multilateral development banks find a way of scaling it up. Some of us, through our bilateral initiatives, also try to scale things up. But you've got to start off somewhere. There's a, that question that uh, you mentioned the importance of political trust. Uh, or as we meet uh, challenges moving ahead, where are the gaps now? And um, will they grow with resets as we go through a post-COVID era? Well, you know, COVID has highlighted the criticality of trust within societies. Um, you know, the very few generalizations, but one of the generalizations coming out of COVID, when you look at countries where there's a lower vaccination rate versus higher vaccination rate, 
countries where people more or less abide by, by the rules. I mean, everyone sitting in the audience is wearing their masks and not trying to sit closer together. And even when we walk outside, we'll all follow the rules. These are countries where there's trust. Everyone knows that it makes sense for them to do the right thing because they know everyone else will do the right thing. Whereas if you have a significant proportion of society not doing the right thing, then more people will also wonder, look, why should I do the right thing? So trust has been critical in, in this case in addressing a pandemic, but it's also critical when you think about some of the broader challenges we have going forward, even on climate transition. Not allowing free riders in the climate transition game is extremely important. And societies and communities of businesses where everyone plays by the rules and people feel a little shamed when they don't play by the rules are the ones that will do better. Yeah. Maybe let me end off uh, with a broad question. Um, you, you mentioned about pandemic and the fact that it was a very unkind uh, period and continues to be an unkind period for many um, societies out there. Um, at the same time, you've seen a lot of kindness um, an outpouring of, of giving in, in these times. Are you optimistic about the future? Why should people, and why should people in this room uh, be optimistic about the shift in philanthropy giving uh, under these uh, circumstances? I lean optimistic. Uh, I think uh, philanthropies and uh, families with some wealth uh, are evolving in their thinking around the world. Part of it is generational change, but part of it is people just can't ignore what is happening in the world around them. Uh, and a whole generation of uh, people with some wealth uh, are now more motivated than ever before uh, to do good. And our task is to organize this so it's not just individual action, um, not just for the sake of putting your name on a building, uh, but it's really about collaboration together uh, to achieve greater impact. It requires organization. It requires, at the end of the day, a culture developing. And that culture has to be one of partnerships between philanthropy, responsible government, and responsible business. I think that's all the time that we have here. Thank you very much, everybody, for your time. Please join Thank me you. in thanking SNC Minister for his speech. Thank you very much, SM.